konoplja i njeni jedinstveni kemijski spojevi zvani kanabinoidi posljednjih četvrt stoljeća predstavljaju vrlo uzbudljivo područje istraživanja, pogotovo od kad je otkriven endokanabinoidni sustav u tijelu i u mozgu čovjeka. Osim što sudjeluje u komunikaciji živčanih stanica, taj sustav ima vrlo važnu ulogu u velikom broju fizioloških procesa. Studija provedena 1988. na sveučilištu St. Louis utvrdila je da u mozgu sisavaca postoji obilje kanabinoidnih receptora u staničnim membranama, te da kanabinoidi iz konoplje nalikuju endokanabinoidima iz tijela sisavaca. Što više, ti receptori prisutni su kod svih vrsta kralježnjaka. Nadalje, Kod embrija u maternici oni se vrlo rano razvijaju i reagiraju sa tvarima koje luči maternica. Potom, u majčinom mlijeku također ima puno kanabinoida koji potiču kod novorođenčeta učenje, razvoj i rast. Kanabinoidi iz konoplje savršeno odgovaraju endokanabinoidnim receptorima u ljudskom tijelu i što više predstavljaju jedan od najvažnijih fizioloških sustava održavanja ravnoteže u tijelu. Endokanabinoidi i njihovi receptori nalaze se svuda u tijelu, u svim tkivima sa drugačijom svrhom, ali uvijek sa istim ciljem, a to je homeostaza, odnosno udržavanje unutarnje ravnoteže organizma. Ipak, kanabinoide, kako one unutar tijela, tako one i izvan tijela, najčešće još uvijek srećemo ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer. Doktor Robert Melamid, biokemičar i molekularni biolog iz SAD-a. Doktor Paul Hornby, zoolog je biokemičar i patolog, a ovdje smo se skupili zbog one teme koja njih dvojicu povezuje, a to je istraživanje učenaka, biokemijskih spojeva i drugih stvari vezanih uz zdravstvene dobroviti biljke poznate kao konoplja. Dobro večer. Kako ste se vi susreli uopće sa konopljom kao potencijalnom biljkom za ozdravljivanje, kao potencijalnim lijekom i na koji način ste se počeli unutar svoje struke baviti istraživanjem konoplje? Well, it actually started very early because when I was 16 I started college and when I was 16 I also started to use cannabis and I'm very ADHD and what cannabis did for me is it made me aware of my inability to focus and that gave me then an opportunity to pay attention more and to learn to focus more and by the time I became a senior in college that's when I finally learned how to study and how to work and then I excelled in graduate school and I always used cannabis because I felt that it opened my mind and really stimulated my curiosity and my intellectual abilities so I mm -hmm. continued to use it and I wound up getting my PhD in radiation biology, specifically uh, repair of DNA damages, which are caused by free radicals in ionized radi in, from ionized radiation. And then as the cannabinoid system uh, was discovered and its connections with signal transmission and metabolism and free radical production, it was just a very natural entry for me to continue the path that I had been on and to you know, really dive into what I was personally experiencing because I've used cannabis for over 53 years and uh, jive that now with the science. So I listen to myself and I listen to other people and see what it can do and then I use my scientific knowledge to bring those together. Mm -hmm. Gospodine Hornby, kako ste se vi susreli sa konopljom u sklopu svoje profesije kao zoologa, biokemičara i sl. Priča možda je malo duža, ali možete malo iskratiti, pa da onda poslije imamo vremena saznati i kakve sve to dobro biti konoplja pruža. Znači, kako je to jedna karijera, to je učinjeno da učinjeno, 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 of cannabis research. I had started a quality control company for herbal medicines in Canada. And a fellow called me up one day and said, can you measure THC in, in cannabis? And I said, sure. And he said, do you have a license? And I said, no. And he said, if you take possession of that sa sample, you're in possession of a legal substance. Do you understand that? 
And I said, not really, because I knew that cannabis was quite non-toxic. Anyway, I had to apply for a license. I got it almost a year later, and I began analyzing THC amounts in hemp plant grown in Canada to make sure that they're less than 0.3%. So I had my room full of hemp samples running th these samples as contract, noting the different cannabinoid profiles in different strains of hemp. And then a fellow introduced me to Hilary Black, the lady that started the first dispensary in Vancouver. This is 20 years ago now. And she said they had seven different strains from Holland that if a person took a person with say chronic pain would go for strain A over and over again, a person with say Crohn's disease, strain B, a person with seizure disorder, strain C over time and time again. And I've been looking at the profiles in hemp and also looking at the profiles now in high THC cannabis and realizing that they were different. And I thought I could relate the profile to the illness and why the people would go back for it time and time again. And boy, was I naive at that time, because it's a lot, about a lot more than that why a person will select a specific strain. It's definitely not amount, really about the amount of THC or CBD in the prep. It's a lot of it's to do with the terpenes, the way it's, the aroma, the way it tastes when they burn it, and also the effect. So there's multiple reasons why a person will uh, choose a specific strain, and then it just evolved from there. I'm a human pathologist, and I got into the biochemistry of how it works, and I meet people like Bob. I go to conferences now, and it just blows my mind <laughs> that we have the most useful plant on the planet illegal. It's not only useful as a medicine, it's used for, for clothing, for petroleum, for building materials. And we've got it illegal, and it just doesn't make sense to me. U stvari, iz određene perspektive, to čak i ima smisla. S obzirom da na vašim predavanjima pokazujete velik broj bolesti na koje konoplja ima pozitivan utjecaj, ako ih čak i ne liječi. U usporednoj tablici također te iste bolesti izražene u milijardama dolara kroz proizvodnju lijekova skupih i sl. No prije nego što se pozabavimo tom ekonomsko-političkom stranom, bilo bi dobro zapravo saznati u čemu je trik, zbog čega je konoplja toliko efikasna u rješavanju mnogih od tih stvari koje ćemo kasnije možda djelomično ispomenuti. To nas vraća u 90. godine kada je prvi put otkriveno da naše tijelo ima ono što se danas naziva endokanabinoidni sustav. Možete nam objasniti kakav je to sustav i kakve veze ima sa biljkom i što se tu u stvari događa da sad odjednom ta nekakva biljka pokazuje pozitivne učinke na širokom spektru bolesti? Well, I have a very unique perspective on all of this. So what I'll tell you is not mainstream, but what is very verifiable from a scientific perspective. And what it does is it breaks out of our paradigm of how we view medicine and health. And what I've done is I've integrated a field of physics known as far from equilibrium thermodynamics. It's about flowing energy, for which uh, Ilya Prigogine got the Nobel Prize in 1977. And what's so unique about this physics, it says that flowing energy organizes matter. Whereas the physics that we teach our students for the most part says that life is too improbable to exist. And it's not based on this idea of flowing energy organizing matter. So when we have the ability to organize things, we have the seed for what can become life and for what can become evolution. And in order for all of that to proceed, we have to have energy generating mechanisms that can capture molecules and transform them into more complex molecules and then organize them into these flow dependent structures. We are flow dependent structures. We eat, we breathe, we get rid of our waste. If you stop any of that, we basically what I call return to equilibrium. We lose the charge of life in our battery, us. And that charge of life is held in the complexity, the flowing biochemistry. And it turns out that our endocannabinoid system regulates two of the most fundamental aspects of life. On the one hand, it regulates via the CB1 receptor that gets you high. It regulates efficient energy production, which we need if we're going to do things. 
But when you do things, just like when you're building a city or anything else, you generate debris, you generate pollution, etc. There has to be a balance between creating things and fixing and preventing the damage. So the CB1 gives us the ability to do things by how it regulates efficient energy production. Very important in the brain, which is always hot, needs to be efficient, otherwise we overheat. But on the other hand, the CB2 receptor, which is typically called the immune receptor or the peripheral receptor, it actually has a very fundamentally unique role in metabolism in that it turns on fat burning. And when cells burn fat, it's not the same as burning sugar. It's not the, it, the pathways are different. They do different things. When you're burning fat, you recycle damaged biochemical molecules, molecules that were damaged when you were building things. So you, if you don't have the right balance, then you just keep degrading over time, aging. That's how we age. Free radicals that we produce in excess are responsible for all of our age-related illnesses. And by fine-tuning energy production, both in the efficient way and by turning on recycling, we can balance the damage production with the resynthesis and utilize that balance to restore health by combining diet and cannabis and staying away from more carbohydrates, which are the efficient mode, but how we damage ourselves and turning on more recycling. Just like we need to do in society, we have to do it in ourselves because it's the same energy that generates life, that generates society. Kada pričamo o kanabinoidima, koliko je do danas otkriveno tih kanabinoida u biljci konoplja koji se mogu prepoznati da na neki način ne djeluju s organizmom ili se još ne zna na koji način djeluju, ali o kojim u stvari, koje količini, da kažemo, aktivnih molekula različitih vrsta razgovaramo? I was listening to Professor Lumir Hanush from Israel in a lecture on Friday, I believe it was. And he's saying there's about 144 cannabinoids identified and he's one of the people, the principles of identifying uh, new cannabinoids with mass spectroscopy. About 144, but a number of those are just fragments of cannabinoids and broken down molecules. But in cannabis, there's really two major actives, CBD and, and THC. And you asked the question of Bob, but I'd like to take a partial answer of that, that Yeah, and you mentioned discovery of the receptor. As a scientist, I read the scientific literature all the time. I remember the day they announced the discovery of the receptor, and since that time, there's been a massive explosion in scientific research around it, what they call the endocannabinoid system. And in my mind, it's as big as the discovery of DNA in the last century or the discovery of insulin. It's a major medical find. And uh, I believe the medical profession should pay attention to it <laughs> because it's not going away and it's only going to get... We're going to learn more and more and more from this, this system. I, I look at it as, as the regulator of regulators in human physiology. Koje godine i tko je otkrio taj endokannabinoidni sustav? Te they discovered the receptor in the late 1980s and was announced in the 1990s. Um, it was discovered... Uh, Dr. Raphael Meshulam gets a lot of credit for the discovery of the receptor. Dr. Hanush, who was instrumental in discovering the first endocannabinoid, will tell a different story because he's worked in that laboratory for years. And, I know as a scientist, not one person does discovery, it's a team. Um, Dr. Hanush has a very funny story about looking for the first, the, the natural uh, compound that was designed to bind the receptor in our bodies. And at that time, most of the experiments were done on mice. So he was trying to extract a molecule from a mouse brain, which is very small. And endocannabinoids are in their picogram uh, per gram amounts, very tiny amounts. So he went to the local market and got a pig brain and extracted it from a pig brain. And he said, when I held the test tube up, there was nothing in it. But when we washed it and added it to the receptor complex, it bound. So, mm -hmm. And he said the price of pig brain went up in the markets in Israel right after that. Mm -hmm. 
Kada pričamo o vezi konoplje i liječenja raka, jer zadnjih godina, od kad postoji knjige Rika Simpsona, primjerice Kanađanina, koji je na neki način prvi u novije vreme otvorio svijetu ono što je nekada davno bilo u stvari u čestoj primjeni, jer konoplje je tradicionalni lijek tijekom cijele ljudske povijesti. Što se to zapravo događa u procesu sa biokemijske točke gledišta, susreta konzumiranja konoplje, konopljenog ulja i sličnih ekstrakata i raka. Zbog čega se pokazao efikasan, a kada pričamo o mehanizmu tumora i rakova? Well, we have to keep in mind that our endocannabinoid system literally regulates everything in our body from conception until death. It regulates the wiggling of the sperm. It regulates how the sperm gets into the egg. It regulates how the egg travels down the overduct. It regulates how the uh, egg implants in the womb. It regulates the differentiation of the organism. It regulates everything in all of us all day, every day. Every time you get hungry, your brain makes some pot and you give yourself the munchies. <laughs> so if you're depressed, you're not happy enough, you need more. If you're overweight, you're eating too much, but when you use extra cannabis and cannabis in general, it shifts that balance, as I was saying, between building and sugar burning versus recycling and fat burning. So it's already been demonstrated that cannabis users are thinner, have lower levels of diabetes, etc., because All of our illnesses result from imbalances in how our energy flows and what we do with it. And, you know, if you're a lumberjack, you can eat 3,000 calories a day. If you're sitting in front of the TV playing video games, you're eating more than you're using. And what your body's going to do, instead of burning all of that and turning it into energy, because you're not asking it to do that with the video game, it's going to turn it into fat. And that fat is going to clog your arteries. It's going to promote inflammation in your brain. So we're talking about Alzheimer's, heart disease, arthritis. All of these illnesses are caused by inflammation, caused by free radicals, caused by how we burn our fuel. And if we're burning too much polluting fuel, sugar, we will pollute ourselves. And if we want to resurrect ourselves and restore ourselves, we have to turn on recycling and rebuilding. And that's what that CB2 receptor will do. So we have to, we have to recognize that we can modulate our illnesses by using the central regulator of everything in our body, combining that with consciousness, with diet, with creating healthy societies instead of ones driven by conflict and fear where the stress promotes biochemical imbalances that promote the free radicals that are behind all of these illnesses, along with things like vaccinations and eating fat-free food, that's one of the stupidest things that, that ever occurred because that means you're only burning carbohydrates. That means you're making more free radicals. That means you're promoting autism and you know, all of these inflammatory diseases like heart disease and arthritis and Alzheimer's disease. And if we don't switch to a hemp-based medical solution, at least in the United States, the, the Alzheimer's alone will bankrupt the system. But when we have a hundred and twenty million dollar, for example, cancer industry, mm -hmm. it's very hard to say, oh, here we have a cure and what you're doing is all wrong when you have all of these people invested in that solution, which doesn't really work, mm -hmm. which makes, you know, think of it. You have a solution here where you can bring people to the edge of death. And if they're lucky enough to live and the cancer is lucky, you know, you're lucky enough that the cancer dies first then it works. So that's the modus operandi. That's the approach. In contrast with cannabis, we make you so healthy that your body rejects the cancer and the cancer can't survive in the healthy body. Što su pokazala istraživanja? Primjerice, nije ih bilo puno, ali ih je nekih bilo na životinjama. Pa eto, još 70-ih se počelo sa štakorima i miševima. Pa se spominja u predavanjima, često spominjate Manuel Guzman, grupu čoveka koji je injektirao zapravo konoplju tumor mozga štakorima i miševima. Što zapravo samo ta konoplja radi konkretno na samom tumoru i okolo. Koji dio spašava, koji dio unuštava, koji dio čuva, koji dio raste? If we think of a car, for example, the car can't do anything unless it's got gasoline. And it's the same with us, and it's the same with everything. For example, a banking system doesn't work if the money's not being spent. You gotta buy and sell, you have to have flow. And when we're dealing with cancer cells, they need flow to be alive and cannabis is regulating those energy pathways so imagine you're driving down a road you got your gasoline car and you run out of gas 
and you go fill it with diesel fuel, it's not going to work. That's what's going on with cannabis and how the receptors manipulate metabolism that's necessary for the cells to live. And because cancer cells have certain special requirements for them to survive, thus all impaired by how cannabis manipulates the fuel supply. Uh, u isto vrijeme, cannabis se zapravo i na neki način štiti okolna tkiva, osim što uništava tumore time što im onemogućuje pristup hrani. Kako štiti ta tkiva? Because of what I was suggesting, that by recycling we fix ourselves. Mm -hmm. You got to remember something very important, something very basic. Psychoactive cannabinoids are in mother's milk. They're in breast milk from all mammals. So as mammals evolved with the characteristic of child care, what are they doing? The first thing they're doing when a child is born is they're getting them stoned so they can relax from the childbirth, to stimulate their appetite, to have them bond with their mother. That's the way nature works. And when we prohibit cannabis, nature gave it to children and you know, to infants, newborn infants, and we're concerned about using it as a medicine? How stupid can we be? Evo, kada pričamo o kanabisu, odnosno konkretno o jednoj od dvije najvažnije tvari, konkretno to je slavna već kratica THC, na neki način se on mora uvijek zagrijavati da bi ga se aktiviralo. Zbog čega? Ko je tu proces prisutan da bi THC bio onda aktivan? Oh, decarboxylation. Uh, that's a big word for knocking CO2 off. It was called THC acid. And THC, THC is present in nature as with an acidic group on it, means COOH. And that's the weakest bond on the molecule. The, With, with that carboxyl group on THC, it can't really bind the receptor. It's got to knock that arm off before it can bind the receptor. That's the weakest bond on the molecule, so you heat up the molecule, and that bond will break, and break off as CO2. And then, it be, then the THC becomes receptor active. So that's why you have to burn cannabis in a joint or heat it in a brownie to get the full active effect from it. Koliko danas se bolesti liječi kanabisom u svijetu? Govorim o legalnim sustavima. Koliko je danas u znanstvenoj zajednici ili u medicinskim sustavima, u nekim barem zemljama, onako prepoznato? That's two questions in one. Yeah. Um, cannabis, I put up a slide in my lecture showing the efficacy of cannabis being the desired effect. It goes from ADD to turret syndrome. Uh, there must be 40 illnesses on this one slide that it affects in a positive way. There's a reason for that, and Bob's mentioned his theory, which I, I'm, I toil with at times, but it <laughs> makes perfect sense and I'm really beginning to like it. But I, I see it as another thing about cannabis, for example, CBD and THC don't only bind the CB1 receptor, but they activate virtually every other receptor system in our brain, 5-HT receptor, GABA receptor, acetylcholine receptor, all of these are modulated by THC, CBD, and the other cannabinoids. That's why it, in my simple mind it has so many effects on different illnesses because it activates receptors. It's once again regulating receptors in our brain to make it homeostasis with the environment and itself and uh, to have a balancing act within the physiology. And it's very important. Vašim popisima, ili tako kažemo, zbirkama znanstvenih istraživanja, vidi se da su neki prvi eksperimenti napravljeni još 70, 1972. godine, gdje se vidjelo, zapravo na neki način se vidjelo da postoje neki efekti, ali je nekako oglašeno da ne postoje. No, možete nam možda vi ispričati kada su prva istraživanja napravljena baš eksperimentalno vezano za utjecaj kanabisa na zdravlje i koliko ih do danas ima i na koji način se, su se zapravo radila? Pa, kako su se reklamirala, također ne bi bilo loše objasniti. Well, you have to understand that cannabis has been used for about 10,000 years. 
and people have been curing numerous illnesses. In fact, all of the illnesses that we today can verify that it looks like from our scientific studies it should work. That's one way of looking at it. Then you have cannabis users today who are using it and doing the things that the scientists are talking about doing, but we're successfully doing it already, curing cancers, arthritis, all sorts of things. Not only, not only you have to look at the word, what does cure mean? You know, it doesn't make it go away forever and stay away. It regulates your biochemistry so that your biochemistry is no longer resulting in that illness. But whatever was creating your biochemical imbalance, your genetics, your environment, the combination of them, unless you change that, you'll recreate the same problem again. So the cannabis for many situations has becomes a lifelong regulator. We should look at it as a food. For example, I use it for my arthritis, for my gout, for my a variety of, of illnesses, you know, psoriasis, etc. I'm never going to not need it. But it, to me, that means it's a food and that these illnesses are nutritional deficiencies. And by consuming these chemicals, because that's what foods are, chemicals, right? We call some of them food and we artificially label some drugs. But the bottom line is, if you take this, you're healthier, you live longer. And if you don't take it, like you can make genetic knockouts so that they have no CB1 receptor. So they're the ideal mouse for our, what our government wants us to be, ideal mice that can't get high. Well, those mice die prematurely. They're so uptight because they have no stress relief from cannabis that they sit there, you know, freaking out all the time. They're not healthy. We need cannabis. The cannabis receptors, whether we use cannabis or not, are always active because they're doing critical things. The CB1 receptor is, is always active. So there's a, we have to recognize that the whole world of medicine and pharmacology that we've created is based on money making and profit, and it's not based on thousands of years of evolving human use of a chemical that people through their trial and error found out was incredibly beneficial. They've recently found cannabis residue in, in uh, remains from 120,000 years ago. That was before modern man was modern man. So this has played a central role in so many lives for so many generations because it's totally safe, no lethal dose, so you don't have to worry about taking too much other than becoming uncomfortable. And you're provided with something that's mimicking mother's milk. What more do you want? Koje su istraživanja rađena do sada što se tiče eksperimenata sa naravno već poslovičnim štakorima? miševima, koja, koja, koja su bila prva, kakvi su bili rezultati, koliko ih danas ima? I would forget about that type of look because what we're having in America today is we have states that have legalized it. So we have data coming out of real world, not artificial laboratory experiments. We have real world accumulated data. And what we're seeing is a decrease in diabetes, a decrease in waste, a decrease in domestic violence, a decrease in alcohol use, a decrease in drug overdoses. And that's just beginning. What will happen everywhere around the world, everywhere, your country, my country, every country, as this truth continues to spread by word of mouth, if you have cancer and you use it, all your friends and family know that it helped you. They tell all their friends and family. That's what's happening right now. We're having a cannabis awakening spreading around the world. And the governments are trying to kill us. They're trying to keep in place the, the uh, regulatory environments that support the industrial pharmaceutical medical complex that is not giving us health. And at the same time, they're denying us this plant that has been used for thousands of years is intrinsic to our very life because of our endocannabinoid system. And they're keeping that out of our hands. Should we arrest nursing mothers, for example, because they have psychoactive cannabinoids in their milk? Maybe we should just arrest all mothers because they're walking around with paraphernalia. I mean, it's gotten to be absurd and the world is recognizing the criminal nature of so much of our governmental activity the lies that we're taught as has that has become our reality and people are waking up because of computers and communication and because of the experience if i cure my cancer i don't care if the fda approved it 
I don't care at all. I know what I did. And we have people, for example, who've cured their skin cancer five times, their breast cancer nine times, you know. They still have to fight to use the medicine? Our governments that are supposed to be protecting us are trying to kill us for the profit uh, that is fed into the system, into the politics, into the law enforcement, why we the people suffer and we are waking up and the revolution is happening as cannabis mm -hmm. spreads around the world and healthcare will change over the next few years mm -hmm. like you've never imagined. Uh, imate pravo, ovo je bilo zanimljivije čuti nego popis eksperimentalnih istraživanja, ali postoji ona. Kad već pričamo o njima, uh, u čemu je razlika uh, danas postoje uh, razna ulja od konoplje u kojima ljudi nastoji imati više THC-a ili manje THC-a, a više drugog sastojka CBD-a i slično. Koja je razlika zapravo između THC-a i CBD-a u funkciji i u ponašanju? The difference between THC and CBD? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, THC is psychoactive for one, and that's a problem for a lot of people. Um, CBD, like Bob was saying, has no, uh, what we call LD50, no lethal dose, and uh, now it is THC. They're, I look at them, they, they work together. But one without the other is completely different than both of them together. And I, I harp a lot up in lectures about what we call the entourage effect, meaning the synergy of the molecules in the cannabis plant. I particularly uh, am fond of cannabidiol, CBD, because it's anti-anxiety for one. Um, it's receptor active on the CB2 receptor. I lose weight on it and keep calm. And also I like to use high THC cannabis later in the day if I'm preconditioning my liver with CBD. I call it preconditioning because CBD blocks the metabolism of THC in the liver. So you're, you're not metabolizing THC to what we call Delta-11 THC, which is a more potent form of THC. And if you, you're not creating that more potent form, you're less likely of an overdose. So you get, I say it makes the, the high less jagged and more of a plateau. And if I'm treating illness, I will always use the two combined at different ratios. If we're Treating cancer, we normally use a higher high ratio of THC to CBD. Chronic pain, THC more than CBD, but CBD is very important for chronic pain. Inflammatory disease, perhaps more CBD. For epilepsy, definitely more CBD than THC. For example, your Croatian hemp plants contain significant levels of cannabidiol, which could be easily used for treating epileptic children. Uh, in Croatia. Um, it's just a matter really of accumulating the active medicine from the plant and making it into a viable form that can be either taken orally or a suppository. So it depends on what illness you're treating, the value of either, but uh, like I say, they, they work together and it's important to use them together. Eto, pričali ste osim o utjecaju na fiziologiju, na stanice, na živčani sustav i na živce. Da li ste jedan primjer zanimljivog istraživanja opet vezanog uz miševe, no ovaj put je bilo vezano uz njihovu kreativnost. Znači kako će se snaći kroz nekakav labirint, zagubilište i sl. Pa kakvi su bili učinci toga s obzirom da je to bio eksperiment usmjereno na to u kojoj mjeri kanabis pomaže stvaranju kreativnih rješenja među životinjama, pa pretpostavljamo onda i među ljudima. Što se u tom eksperimentu zbivalo? Well, I'm not sure of the exact experiment you're referring to, but I'll refer to an experiment that will address what I think is the issue. You know, what's the difference between somebody that's linear and non-creative versus someone that creates newness? And this is a very interesting experiment that was done with wild-type normal mice as opposed to the CB1 knockout mice that can't get high. Whoops, I think I just did something bad. Um, so what they did was they have a maze. It's a big round 
table with water in it, and the water is cloudy, so you can't see. Mm -hmm. And they have a platform in there. And you put the normal mice, or you put the knockout mice that can't get high, CB1 knockout, and you put them in there, and they, you know, they, each type of mouse will swim around and freak out because they don't like what you've done to them. And they eventually find the platform. And if you take them out and put them back in, they'll go right to the platform. Now you move the platform to a different position, and you take the mice and you put them in there, and the, the normal wild-type mice will go to where it used to be, freak out, it's not there, swim around, find the new place. And then you take them out and you put them in, they go to the new place. With the cannabis-deficient mice, the same thing happens. You put them in, they freak out, it's not there where it used to be, they s explore, find the new place, you take them out, you put them in, they go to the old place. They were hardwired. As they learn, they learn in a way that's very rigid. That's the opposite of creativity, you see? So if you load yourself up with rules, you're always trying to f f fulfill the rules. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you load yourself up with love and happiness and openness, then your next instant is open to you and you can come up with creative solutions to things. I've been using cannabis, as I said, for 53 years, but I've used high doses for a long time. I've come up with patents. You know, I've been chairman of the biology department, uh, started public companies, created new forms of science that hopefully will be tested by others, and we will, aside from all of us stoners, who it fits very nicely with. And uh, uh, modern man, when you look up the evolutionary scale, Cannabinoid receptors, the ones that get us high, first appeared with the appearance of vertebrates. And what vertebrates do much better than invertebrates is we adapt. That's why we have iPhones and they don't, okay? And what, what we've really done is we've enhanced the creative ability by having this cannabinoid receptors modulate our energy production so that we don't kill our nerve cells. It actually is responsible, unlike what people have said for years, it's gonna destroy your brain. It does the exact opposite. It's responsible for generating nerve cells and for generating new connections and plasticity. That's what enhances adaptability. That's what life is about. Nature doesn't select for strength or intelligence. It selects for your ability to adapt every instant at the next sentence. You know, the next second. And that's what your, your cells are doing and the biochemistry in your cells. And that's what cannabis is the central regulator of all of that. It's what allowed us to develop and become human. And as you see in the brain, the progression in the vertebrates as you go up the evolutionary scale, you see that in the evolutionary most advanced areas of the brain are where there are more cannabinoid receptors. There are more cannabinoid receptors and activity in the brain than all of the other receptors and we don't teach it in medical school. I mean, the system is so stacked against the intelligence, the opportunity, and the health that can be provided by cannabis because of the corruption and the special interest in our governments, in our political systems, that it's only with the raising of the voice of the people as they start to learn the truth, as they see their family, their friends, and themselves getting healed or feeling better, it's only then that the tide will change and this is gonna end because if politicians in the future wanna be elected, they have to support it. We don't want them supporting medicine that's gonna kill us and food that's gonna kill us. We want to be free and support, use our knowledge to drive us into a successful future, not hampered by government. Mm -hmm. well, ovim vašim tezama da zapravo vlade na neki način žele sačuvati to znanje u tajnosti i jest i činjenica koja govori o tome da recimo u jednom starom istraživanju još iz 70-ih godina koje se istraživalo, bavilo istraživanjem upotrebe kanabisa, usprko s rezultatima zaključak je bio da ne postoje nikakva medicinska vrednost u kanabisu, što je praktički skoro nevjerojatan zaključak s obzirom da ih ima toliko i da ih zapravo svi vide na kraju krajeva daleko smo danas stigli već od onih ideja od prije 10-15 godina kada su u nizozemskoj drugi prepoznali da recimo ljudi koji se liječu od kemoterapije smanjuju simptome, lakše jedu, bolje spavaju koristići kanabis. Na koji način, s obzirom da sad pričamo o utjecaju kanabisa na naš organizam iznutra. Međutim, primjećeno je i Rick Simpson osobno je tako sebi liječio opekline i rak kože, a također i drugi ljudi koji su imali neke rane i takve opekline, da ulje od kanabisa kada se maže na kožu, 
rješava mnoge kožne probleme, ubrzava zarastivanje opekline i sl. Koji je tu proces po sredi? To je znači nešto što se ne može nazvati primjenom koja bi se mogla i na koji način nazivati nekakvom, ono, kao, kako bi se to reklo, kolokvijalno napušavanjem. Radi se o mehaničkoj primjeni na koži. Koji su tu rezultati do sad postignuti? I gather your questions about topicals and, and their application. I didn't really understand the, the translation, but um, I didn't believe in topicals until cannabis came along. And I've seen, witnessed uh, many good results with topical cannabis. For example, with burns, if you're after what type of medicine the plant to use, I would suggest to use THCA extract on a burn because it's antimicrobial, antiviral, whereas THC doesn't have the same amount of property. Um, and also for children with epileptics, moms will put a CBD cream on their backs at night to help them prevent seizures during the night. And we've seen great effects with that. Um, and also injured uh, football players, hockey players, professional sport players will put cannabidiol cream on a sore muscle, THC cream too, and they show positive effect as well. I'm more of an oral cannabis medicine guy. Bob may know more about topicals than myself, but um, they are useful in that form as, as topicals. S kakvim ste se zakonskim problemima i izazovima susretali u Kanadi kada ste radili laboratorije i svoje staklenike za istraživanje učinaka kanabisa? S kakvim ste se zakonskim problemima susretali kada ste radili svoje istraživanje u Kanadi sa kanabisom? Znači što se tiče zakonskih dozvola, što se tiče uzgoja u vašem stakleniku i sl. Uh, I grow it at home. Um, I believe everybody should grow cannabis at home and grow enough to use for the family. Um, in the case of outdoor growing, um, for example, hemp is often grown in large fields where there's wind blowing through it and dust sticks to the trichomes. The trichomes are the medicinal glands of the plant, the exudate glands. And you get dust in the trichomes. And it's very difficult to get that, remove that from the plant and the, and the medicine part of the plant. I've often said that medicinal grade cannabis should be grown in greenhouses or under glass because you eliminate that kind of dirt. And also, I'm a great believer in the quality control and standardization of cannabis. I've been about that since day one, that you should have a specific dosage of cannabis time and time again, that you can work into a regimen uh, of dosing. Kao istraživač jednog područja i zapravo materijala koji je zakonski zabranjen, kako ste se, s čim ste se suočavali, sa kakvim zakonskim izazovima? Jel ste imali pristup materijalu, jeste li imali problema s policijom i sl. istražujući konoplju? I, the year 2000, I had a, a small farm, two hectares, near the city of Vancouver, and we were growing cannabis under contract with the dispensary I, I mentioned earlier. They put us under contract and we were growing the seven strains from Holland that I mentioned. And we got raided by police and it was terribly traumatic uh, for our whole team. Um, we, we broke up and I was given six months house arrest and couldn't drive the kids to school and so on. But I, I never for a day stopped analyzing cannabis by my method in my, my office on the farm. Um, I've worked with my blinds half open for many years, watching for a yellow stripe on a pant leg, which means our government police is coming to knock on the door, kicking in. Also, I had my lab in a quasi-legal umbrella under a dispensary in Vancouver for many years 
that gave me some protection. Indeed, I had a license from what we call Health Canada, which was a regulatory board in Canada to analyze hemp in the early days, but they took that away from me when I got busted. Because I'm, uh, I don't obey all the rules. I tend, I say I know the rules before I break them, but I, I never quit researching cannabis since I started doing it in the early days. I never have stopped. Mm -hmm. I've never had a short supply of material because people bring it to me. And I'm an analyst by trade. I, I look at, I quantify and identify the compounds in cannabis. So I've had uh, that material to work since, since day one. And uh, I still try to make sense of it all. Eto, u vašim predavanjima također spominjete ono s čim smo i počeli ovaj razgovor, to jest negdje u početku se govorilo o mehanizmu pomoću kojeg kanabis pozitivno dijelo na tumore i rak. Konkretno, postoji ta molekula VEGF koja na neki način nju se pokušava smišljati razne ljekove koje bi je gasile i tako dalje, no... Bez te molekule tumor nema osvrlju krvlju, kanabinoidi, odnosno kanabis automatski na neki način to radi. Koje danas biste rekli da ste u svom iskustvu imali situacije u kojima je kanabis izlječio bolesti koje se smatraju danas neizlječivim? I također bi bilo zanimljivo čuti da ipak kanabis neće uvijek i svakome pomoći. Znači, nije kao i obično zdravlje samo u rukama nekog lijeka čarovnog koji ćete izlječiti. Pa bi bilo zanimljivo čuti ko su ograničenja i koje su dostignuće koje ste do sad vidjeli kada pričamo o učincima kanabisa na liječenje ljudi. Well, the limitations are our lack of understanding as to how this is able to regulate life at the most fundamental level. So too much of our research is, is focused on what I call reductionism. You know, they just keep trying to look smaller and smaller at the same thing and not standing back to take an overview of what's going on. So, so that's, a I think, a fundamental issue in, in the scientific world. Give me the questions again. Uh, riječ je bilo uh, o tome koje bolesti su danas se pokazalo right. da se liječe okay, kanabisom. So, so, you know, I myself have numerous illnesses. I've used cannabis, as I said, for many, many years, but I'm almost 70 years old. And I have a lot of genetic predispositions. I've had accidents. I've had all sorts of things that I've used cannabis for. So I have no doubt as to its effectiveness because that's why I use it. I don't use it because it doesn't work. I use it because it does work. <laughs> And uh, in, in terms of so many cancers, we've seen miraculous cases where people are sent home and said, you know, you're going to die in a week. And it's now years later. You can reverse the most horrendous things. I, I saw one guy, for example, I met where he was told that he should come in and have his uh, bowel resected. He had colon cancer. And before he went, this was a few weeks, you know, when he was diagnosed and they always try to get you quick, you know. Uh, but he held off for a few weeks and took cannabis and then he went in and they took out a foot of his colon, but the cancer was already gone. Mm -hmm. Međutim, postoje ljudi kod kojih uh, se dogodi da i nije tako efikasno liječenje. Of course, of nemoš, course. Ja. But you got to understand something. First of all, it works for everybody because otherwise we wouldn't be alive mm -hmm. because it regulates everything in your body. You wouldn't be, have gotten here to begin with. So it works for everybody. The question is, as we age and as we reach the weak points of our unique biochemistry and, and genetics, what can we do to help restore things? And the restoration requires that we re-guide the energy that is coming through us that's creating the cancer into some other format where it'll create health. And the biggest thing that we do is we eat and we breathe and we do things. Well, if you're breathing dirty air and you're eating fat-free food so that you don't turn on your recycling and you're eating food that's loaded with, you know, all sorts of nasty coloring and other chemicals that are not part of our normal food. I must say the food here in Slovenia seems to be excellent and in the Balkans you've got such wonderful resources in terms of farming still occurring at a family level. You haven't turned into, into as much industrial and GMO nonsense as, as I see in America for the most part. So you're still in a point of time where you can grab a hold of your social structure and shift it in a 
a healthy direction that will promote you being able to do the same thing with your body via your food and having access to cannabis and other plant materials that actually do promote health instead of bring you closer to death mm -hmm. with an occasional little help. Mm -hmm. uh, with a little help from our friends. Exactly. Uh, gospodine Melabit, gospodine Hornby, hvala vam na gostovanju do neke sljedeće prilike i sretan vam put gdje god ste na umili dalje odavde. A eto, hvala vama na pažnji. Uh, dakle, ovaj razgovor o medicinskim potencijalima biljke koji mnogi nazivaju najljekovitijom biljkom na svijetu, nije se vodio prvi put, vjerojatno neće ni zadnji. Velike su se promjene dogodile u deseta godina na području percepcije konoplje iz nekakve opasne i zabranjene biljke u ljekoviti izvor ne samo zdravlja, nego i hrane i materijala za sve od odiće do betona praktički. Uz malo mašte možda se možemo usuditi zamisliti situaciju za desetak godina od sad. Kako bilo, ta biljka koja lako raste bilo gdje ne zahtjeva puno, pomaže kod desetaka bolesti, a i mi sami kao što smo čuli više puta imamo endokanabinoidni sustav u našim tijelima koji kao da je skrojen ili prema kojemu kao da su skrojeni kanabinoidi iz konoplje. U tom svijetlu svakako imamo dovoljno razloga za reći laku noć.